SEU 503, our union. I am a member like all of you, and I am a public employee. I work for, uh, I've been employed um, for a long time with the state of Oregon as an employment department worker. I'm gonna to start today by acknowledging um, the world as we, uh, the world that we're looking at uh, tonight. I know that uh, if you're here on this call, that you want to make the world a better place and that you care about people and um, you want that and you care about that enough that you're willing to uh, devote uh, your time and efforts uh, to further that cause. So being that way, being the way you are, there's no way that you couldn't um, avoid feeling emotional and, and uh, feeling strongly about what's going on uh, right now, all the different things that are going on, and particularly the fact that these, a lot of these different things that are going on impact different people. Uh, differently for um, often for the completely arbitrary reason of the color of their skin. So I want you all to know that the reason we have a union uh, is to be there for each other. So I want everyone to know that SAU 503 and its members, its staff are, are here for you and they're here for your coworkers. And I want to especially uh, uh, call out to the people, uh, people on this uh, Zoom meeting who are people of color and especially, especially uh, our, our black members. Um, if there's anything that we can do for you that we're not doing, please let us know. You can contact me directly. Uh, you can contact our executive director, Melissa Unger, directly. Um, you can contact your organizer, but let us know. And because uh, whatever, whatever we can do, we're going to do. That, that's our purpose. Uh, that's why, again, that's why we exist as a union. Now, one of the things that are going on, of course, is uh, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's had a great effect, obviously, on how we uh, carry out our mission. Uh, look, look at what we're doing tonight. We're meeting by Zoom instead of what we originally thought was to take a new, uh, more robust local officer training out in the field, out to the different regions of the state and meet with you in person. I regret that we're not able to meet in person. I would have liked to meet with you. I am grateful that we have this technology. Uh, uh, like Zoom, uh, much better than a conference call, of course. And one of the advantages is that I can see some faces and we can uh, show material on the screen if you're participating by a device. So that's, uh, you know, that was a relatively, you know, we consider everything a relatively minor adjustment to make, but some adjustments and changes and impacts of COVID-19 are, are not minor, they're major and they affect workers and our members uh, profoundly. And so SEIU 503 has uh, is stepped up uh, to address the needs of our members and their families. Uh, one of the things uh, that we've done was uh, the board of directors of 503 uh, established a hardship fund. Uh, they, uh, we funded it with some money from 503 and we also took donations. And that fund distributed uh, 212 thousand six hundred dollars to over one thousand of our members of 503 we also uh, distributed personal protective equipment PPE uh, 1329 kits um, to people who needed those particularly people who need those to perform their jobs and and have some degree of uh, safety and we worked uh, quickly, uh, effectively, and strongly with the, uh, with the employers of our members to uh, establish letter of agreements that cover 
most of the members of 503s to expand um, options and, and protections for our members uh, in the workplace, including uh, expanded op uh, options for leave and, and in some cases telework and, and other things to um, uh, help get them through uh, this pandemic. We've also established uh, a resource page uh, on our website. It has a lot of uh, good information and resources and also has links to other uh, sites with lots of good resources. Uh, if you go to 503, um, uh, seiu503.org, uh, you can find it fairly easily. There'll, there'll be specific pages for specific work sectors. It's very useful. And I encourage you to check that out, and I encourage you to let uh, your coworkers and other members know about it as well. So thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for making um, uh, the time and the space in your lives to take on the roles that, that you've taken on. While we continue to build power for our members, um, our members, the work our members does do is, is just critical to keeping our community safe and our state functioning. We're going to continue to face challenges as a union and in our communities. And we know that the way we lead in our sublocals um, is crucial to this because you're the sublocals are the base. That, that's the baseline. Now, that's where the that's really where the rubber meets the road. And as the elected leaders of those sublocals, you're critical in making this a success not just in carrying out the missions and initiatives of, of the union, but also letting uh, the organization know uh, as someone there on the ground what, ne what needs to be done and what are, the, where, what are the creative ideas for accomplishing that. In the next hour, uh, we're gonna talk about SAU 503's uh, vision and plan. Uh, Melissa's gonna lead us on that. And we'll talk about the roles and responsibilities of sublocal leaders. And we'll talk about governance, how it works uh, in our union. And then, uh, of course, uh, we'll ha there's a second half of the training, which will uh, and we'll continue on Wednesday night. Uh, so before I turn over to Melissa, though, let's do a quick poll. Unfortunately, if you're on a unfortunately if you're on a phone, you won't be able to participate in this. But this, uh, this is kind of a, pra a little practice exercise for Zoom. Again, it's kind of for fun. What you see, should see on your screen right now is a question. How are you feeling about your new role? Go ahead and use your cursor uh, or touch screen to click excited. We're going to change the world. Where do I start? Why did I do this? And wait, I was elected. Again, just for fun, go ahead and uh, select an answer, and then at the bottom, uh, click Submit, and uh, we'll get an instantaneous, pretty much instantaneous uh, response, report out from uh, Marika on what the result was. So uh, thanks, everybody. At this point, I'll turn it over to our Executive Director, Melissa Unger. Thanks, Steve. Um, I am gonna, I have the opportunity to really review our five-year strategic plan with all of you. I wanna repeat what Steve said. I wanna thank everyone for showing up tonight. And we've done this a couple different times and it's been a great opportunity to see folks um, coming together across the state, um, all at the um, same time to kind of think about um, yourself in this role and as a leader. Um, you know, Go to the next slide, go ahead. Um, you know, we wrote this strategic plan, um, a, we started the path to write the strategic plan a little over a year ago, um, and I think the reality is, is that we want to be a union that is united and strategic and visionary, and to do that, our board really thought that it was important to really get feedback and thoughts from members about how to do that, and to really um, chart our future together. Um, and I really think this five-year strategic plan is less of a plan and more of a vision, um, but is um, a really great document that grounds us in what we should be doing um, and that we have a lot of work to do. I think the great thing about our union is that we represent 72,000 plus people. Um, we are the largest union in the state of Oregon. 
We have so much potential to fight for working families. And at the same time, all of you know this um, better than I do sometimes, that we also have to be on the, um, you know, in our communities and in our work sites, um, really representing people when they need representation, we need to have their back. And so I think the goal of this plan is to really do both, make sure that we're the union that um, members see and need when they need representation in their community or in their work, and that we're the union that's um, fighting to represent and protect all workers. Next slide. You know, I think the context of this plan is really critical. And to be honest, I think the context of this plan is even more stark today than it was when we wrote the plan. So we wrote this plan a year ago. And if you look at the, um, this, these graphs, that um, graph on the left, the red piece shows um, a year, you know, this was created a year ago. I actually think this is from 2018. The, um, the amount of wealth held by the people um, people who are in the 50th percent, the bottom 50th percentile of income across our country. And the right is three people, three men. Um, and um, that is even more stark today because that says that Jeff Bezos is worth $160 billion. I believe he just became the first trillionaire um uh in the course of how much money he's m pretty much made off the coronavirus um and so uh i think that to put this graph into context is important to put it into context right now because it is not this was two years ago and during this crisis um just to think about oregon for an instance we have four hundred thousand people who have filed for unemployment 75 percent of them make under $55,000 a year. So um, the amount of wealth and um, stability that has been lost in this moment is, um, is shocking. And at the same time as that that has happened, Congress passed um, uh, um, in the CARES Act, just a tiny little piece of the CARES Act, was a giant tax cut that went to people who make, um, that 88% of the people who will get that tax cut make over $500,000 and $86 billion was given to um, people who make over $500,000. At the same time, as we know here in Oregon and across the country, people can't even get unemployment checks delivered to them in a timely manner to pay their rent. And so the system was rigged before this crisis the system continues to be rigged, and we have seen that play out in the starkest, most severe ways. And I think it goes to um, who, where wealth is going, but it also goes to how this coronavirus is ravaging black and brown communities in a way that is different um, than white communities. And that, um, and that um, you know, the deaths um, from the coronavirus are um, significantly more severe um, in black and brown communities. And that's not because um, they're, it's not because uh, they are sicker. It is because there is structural racism in the healthcare systems and their access to healthcare in their communities and their housing um, that set up those dynamics. And so I, I really have continued every time I've done this presentation, it's important to think about the context this plan was written in. And it's, more, it's as equally important to think about the context that we continue to be in and how this crisis did not create these inequities but the inequities that are playing out are not new. They are just um, really lifted up because of the crisis. Next slide. And I really do think the solution here is um, that we have to protect all workers and that they have to have a union. I wanna say as I do this, as I do these slides, um, please feel free to either chat questions and or to chat like the ways that this shows up for you and your role as a leader in their union, the way it shows up for you as a person. Um, so please feel free. I, I'm, I find that people using the chat can often come up with good conversations while um, someone's presenting at you on a Zoom call. Um, so I just wanna say that like, you know, think about how is this impact, how how, how does this um, how does the system show up? I mean, I see I see folks from higher ed on the call, and I think you know there's higher ed to me is a very um, clear example of this where um, there's um, such stark wealth disparity amongst the students and amongst the staff. Um, so you know, I think as we think about the union power, and the, I think these graphs are really clear on um, the union difference that you know for women for black union members, for Latinos, um, and, and for um, 
white folk too, white folks too, like the difference between a union and a non-union is thousands and thousands of dollars um, in terms of wages, but it's also, it's retirement benefits, it's healthcare benefits, and it's paid sick leave. So the only way that we can re, um, readjust the disparities that exist is to make sure that we are really um, we are really lifting up unions in this moment and making sure that all workers have the protections of a union um, and also to make sure that when places um, are don't have the protection of a union that workers have protection like passing paid sick leave for everyone passing retirement um, and so I think these are all this is a really key element to how we fight back against this rigged system it's not and I think that as we think about our plan, it is in this context that we write that plan. And this is an important context for how we as a union will think about the next five years and the work ahead of us. Next slide. So how did we write this plan? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, so uh, we did a couple of different things. We started off with these member regional meetings um, that uh, you know we were hoping to do again, where we traveled the state and listened to members. We asked three key questions. Um, what keeps you up at night? What keeps, um, what imp issues are impacting your community? And what should your union do about it? And it was really interesting to hear the answers to those questions. Um, lots of them were similar, but I think the overwhelming um, uh, comments that we heard was just like being, you know, whether it was healthcare or benefits, uh, benefits came up, but a lot of fear for their kids in the future. And I just think about this moment in today and um, how people feel that so deeply right now. Um, and that was a feeling one year ago. And I think that like, I, it just kind of keeps bringing me back to them, them to how what we did a year ago was really um, under, like foreseeing, um, you know, the inequities that are playing out today and in this crisis. We did a member qualitative poll. Um, so, you know, where we really just um, randomly selected members to answer similar questions through a poll. So we were not just getting kind of leaders perspective that were coming to regional meetings, but also members perspective. Um, and um, then we also uh, did a strategic planning retreat with our board and member leaders and some staff. Board the board took this process and really um, tried to bring a plan together that was focusing on overall strategies and not specific issues that br would bring us through the next five years. Because this is one document, um, and um, I think the hard thing to continue, I continue to put into context as I look at this is, this is not something we can accomplish in a year, but the goal is how do we accomplish over five years. So I'm just gonna go over um, a high level of the things, and this will be in your, um, in your folder that will have access to these materials so you can read the plan too. Next slide. So the three, there's three main areas. We got to grow our member run union. We got to provide quality services and we got to win for Oreg all Oregonians. Um, and we really kind of, I think, could put, the, put all the strategies context in those three buckets. Next slide. So um, this area around members leading at the forefront of our union is um, the, I think the, it's very comprehensive in the plan. And I, um, I really think this is a place where members really highlighted that we have to do some of the things that we do now. We have to win strong contracts that increase wages and create and protect benefits. And we need to do that with members leading, members at the forefront and members active. Um, and that is something that we do and that we have to continue to do and we need to continue to do well. And in this, you know, as we face an unknown budget situation, we have to really lift that up um, because um, we know we are a government funded union, meaning um, nearly every member of ours is funded through, a gov um, through um, the government. And so how do we make sure that we're lifting up the need for these services and the need for these jobs um, as we go into contract negotiations during a budget crisis? We need to be the voice on the job members need, as I talked about it, so much of um, uh, what folks look to their union is to have their back when they didn't know they needed it. And so that is a big piece to this. How do we do um, good representation? How do we elevate and continue to train stewards? How do we make sure people have the information they need? Um, there was a huge piece in our plan around communication. Um, I, I think it probably only got three or four um, mentions, but it was a big piece of the conversation. We, you know, since this plan was written, one of the big goals, um, we have a podcast. We're trying to communicate in every way possible in terms of online, um, 
social media, trying to really figure out how do you do surround sound communications was a big piece of what folks um, really wanted to lead on. And one thing that's coming out of this plan that we're starting with this, you all as a new group of leaders, is also um, doing monthly leader calls so that people can get updated about the monthly stuff um, that we're doing as a union and also give feedback into that program. So um, that's a part of, I think, came out of this plan, but something we're starting with this new cohort, cohort of leaders who just got elected across our union so we'll be starting those in June and then really thinking about how do we build a diverse union leadership that really reflects the diversity of our union um, and so I think that's a really important piece and feel free folks as I'm talking to chat ideas and um, add things to this if you have any ideas I see a couple of chats coming in um, but I think in this piece was really about how do we think about leadership um, but also then how do we think about the realities of Janice and um, um, how do we think about the realities of Supreme Court cases that have made it so that people do not have to pay for the representation that they get? Um, and that, um, that has impacted us in a lot of ways, but one of the ways that has to impact us is how do we make sure that we're engaging and communicating with members on the first day of work? And how do we create systematic ways to do that so that they know who their union is, what they are, and why they should care? Next slide. So this was actually, I think, one of the bigger, newer areas of our plan. Um, really thinking about what is our union's role in workforce. And um, we have always, I think, consistently been a union that has advocated for quality public services. Um, and I think we need to continue to be a union that advocates for quality public services when our members are uh, consistently talk about one of the reasons they do their work and the reasons they think their work is important is because they want to be delivering services to Oregonians and they believe that their jobs matter. Um, and so in order to do that, they need the ability to deliver quality services and those services need to be funded. So that's a piece of the work that we believe is important. We also really think about how do we train and engage workers and the, um, how do we, how does our union get engaged in training and developing workforce options? One example that came up that people were really excited about during this planning process was that there's an SEIU local in California that does apprenticeship programs um, and like take somebody who has one job as um, uh, an office specialist and then it works them, works with them to become an IT specialist or other different roles and how, what are opportunities for us as a union to be engaged in that and do that, I think is really important. Um, and I think it's a real opportunity for us. Um, and then we we represent, as many of you know, who are on the call, um, who are part of home care and nursing homes and assisted living facilities. But um, the workforce um, in the uh, long-term care systems is very um, disjointed. And um, one of the goals coming out of this plan is for us to really lead, um, to really lead on fixing that and to really think about how can we be a part of that. And I think this is a newer part of our plan, but it's a really exciting part of our plan, I think, um, to think about how does our union get involved in helping people um, both achieve their work and personal goals? And how do we also make sure that we're involved in the training of um, the workers to do their jobs in the ways that they want to? We hear from workers all the time that they don't get the training that they want. So what is our opportunity and role to help people get the training they want to succeed in their job? We can't train to every classification potentially for the state, but we can provide other wraparound trainings that help people in their roles and their jobs and potentially development. So this is a part of the plan that was new and I think an exciting part of the plan. And then the final um, next piece, Um, so how do we continue to build power for all Oregonians? And so, as I said at the beginning of this, a bit of our challenge as a union is to be that union that somebody needs on that Wednesday when they get called into a meeting that they didn't know they were going to get called into, or they get a call from um, that their provider number is being reviewed. We need to be the union that one and needs and we need to be the union that all workers need to have a voice in our state um, and have the rights that they need as a state we need to be both and so this piece is really about how are we a union that builds power for all working Oregonians um, and how do we make sure that we bring more workers together in union how do we make sure that we have the opportunity to uh, make sure that every worker who wants a union has the right to have a union and can do that without fear and without intimidation um, that is a huge thing for us and we know that as we grow and as more workers come together in union together we build power for um, the current members we have and the more and the more people who don't so that is a huge piece of who we need to how we need to continue to grow and how we need to continue to do our work 
um, you know, we are engaged in politics to make sure that pol um, that politicians um, can um, listen to workers. We need to make sure that the politic the political system works for all Oregon fa Oregon families. Um, that um, it is not um, just ran by a handful of ha high powered lobbyists, but they listen to our workers and our members and our voices. Um, and as they make key decisions that impact them, we've had some success here over the years, but we know that we don't have um, unilateral success and we need to continue to lift this up um, because we need to make sure that politics work. Um, and then something that came up a lot, um, especially um, when we talked to our members was about like, how do we run campaigns that lift up the need for overall programs like retirement? You know, we've been a huge part of the healthcare campaign over the um, course of the last 10 years or 15 years or 30 years, to be honest. Um, uh, and, ha and we know that when other, you know, when non-union workers or even our own union workers sometimes have no access to health care, um, that there are members who do have access to health care, have a tougher time keeping that good health care if other people don't have health care. So how do we run campaigns that lift up the need for good health care benefits, for good retirement benefits across the board? Um, and then I think, you know, Steve mentioned this at the beginning, but this piece is more important than ever. Um, that we're linking the fight for economic, racial, environmental, and gender justice. But a big piece of this is how do we become an anti-racist organization? How do we lead on making sure that we're calling out the white, um, the anti-black racism that exists right now in our country that is playing out on our streets right now? As um, um, And how do we make sure that we're being a powerful voice um, against the systems of white supremacy um, and how do we, and I, I, you know, I think right now this feels so important for us as a union to define who we are in this moment and who our members need us to be and who our, um, and who our, um, our members of color and our black members need to see um, our union being to um, voice our outrage um, at the incidents, um, but not just one incident, this ongoing incidents. I mean, this is not one thing. It's um, this is an example of ongoing racism, that um, anti-black racism that exists in our society. So this feels important. And I think when you put it into context of the coronavirus, I think it also does link all of these things. Um, uh, you know, the structural racism that exists for black and brown folks then means that um, they, um, the economic um, injustice that happens when they lose their job, the inability to be able to make sure that they can um, pay their rent, it is a cycle. Um, and um, we need to be a part of dismantling that cycle. And so I think that's a big thing um, that comes out of this plan and in this moment at this time feels like a critical component. And I do also want to just note, for us, this has been a lot of progress as a union. I looked at our strategic plan five years ago and it did not have anything. It did not mention race um, and it didn't have anything on any of this pieces of justice. I think that this is continued work and we have more work to do to grow as a union here. Um, and I think, um, I think this plan puts us on the path to figure that out. So um, that's really what our plan is. I'm uh, like, I, I think it is, uh, you know, how do we do both of these things? I'm excited about it. I'm excited to lead with all of you on it. Um, as leaders of our union um, and excited to continue to work with you. So thanks for taking the time. I'd like we're on a Zoom call, but I, I could still talk with on my hands as much as I possibly could, if you could. Um, and I think, Think that I'm um, excited about um, All right, uh, thanks, Melissa. And for those of you on the phone, if um, we're seeing the the poll results, and 43% uh, uh, are excited about their new role, which is fantastic, and 34% uh, uh, selected where uh, where do I start? So uh, that's great. Thanks, everyone. So uh, next on the agenda, we're going to talk about uh, the roles and responsibilities of elected uh, sublocal leaders. And I, I want to stress that the primary source documents to establish your roles and responsibilities is the constitution and bylaws of your sublocal. So if you have not read those yet, please uh, make sure to read them. I think you've all been provided a copy, but if you need a copy or a link to them, uh, uh, let us know. We'll provide those to you. Again, it's important that you review those so you know what it is exactly you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. 
uh, in order to carry out your official uh, responsibilities as an elected leader. I also encourage you to take a look at uh, 503's bylaws, and you can find those uh, on our website. If you go to saufive03.org, and make sure you go to the member page and click uh, the Get Involved tab and select Leadership and Governance, and you'll get a list. And one of those lists will be uh, uh, our bylaws. And if you look at the table of contents for the bylaws, you'll see that some articles in the Constitution bylaws or in our bylaws are about locals. So I suggest that you at least read those articles so you understand how uh, locals are supposed to function and how they fit in uh, to the governance of SEA 503. Now, even though uh, every uh, sublocal's constitutional bylaws may have some differences, there are some things that are uh, pretty much in common and are going to be the primary responsibilities of you as elected leaders. Uh, those include uh, uh, maintaining uh, SAU 503 membership and union solidarity, uh, maintaining the strong membership uh, within your local, uh, and you'll have responsibility for growing the membership within your local uh, uh, signing people up who aren't members, making sure that new, uh, making contact with new employees, and make sure, making sure they get signed up. It's our membership and the strength of our membership really is what creates power. Uh, one example where it's crucial is in bargaining, where we go uh, to the table with management to try to improve workplace conditions and uh, uh, worker power and having uh, a strong membership base is, is crucial to that. Um, and if any of you have uh, any ideas or questions about that, go ahead and use that uh, chat function to uh, share those as we go through this stuff. Uh, you also, uh, a responsibility is to help coworkers get active in our fight for justice and member power and to lead uh, local member actions. Um, uh, Melissa set out uh, our vi some of our visions and goals of our union, but uh, down at your level, how do we get uh, uh, how do we get members engaged in that and, and uh, carry out and support those? Um, you'll be looked to to educate, communicate, and organize in your sublocal around union issues. And I invite you to put in chat any ideas you have or about issues that you would like to organize around as a leader. You wanna make sure as a sublocal leader that you have uh, structures in place or you're making sure st uh, structures that are in place are functioning uh, so that you can interact around uh, issues. And that includes uh, making sure your chief steward has um, the means uh, to organize steward councils or uh, steward systems. Uh, it's your responsibility as an elected leader to support decisions, to ultimately support decisions that are made by the membership and the elected leaders of the union, irrespective of how, how you voted and what your personal position is. That's one of the things that come with withholding elected office. And of course, as elected leaders, you should refrain from any actions that harm um, and make sure that union spaces are inclusive and respectful for all members. And we have a policy in place that addresses that uh, directly. And when I say we have a policy in place, the board, uh, 503 Board of Directors formally adopted a code of conduct policy that addresses um, this issue of making sure that union spaces uh, and union meetings particularly are open and inclusive and that no one is made to feel unwelcome or uh, forced to feel they have to remain silent. So uh, we are going, uh, the code of conduct policy should be included in the materials that you've been provided. We will be offering a code of conduct training. Um, so look out for that. I encourage everyone to participate in that. Uh, I'll, I'm just gonna uh, quickly touch on, on some of the things that are addressed in the policy. Uh, violent threats or language uh, directed against another person, uh, discriminatory, discriminatory jokes and language. Um, that includes ableist jokes and language. Um, 
this this code of conduct policy is designed to be inclusive of all groups that have traditionally been disempowered, including the people that suffer impairments. Uh, of course, no sexually explicit or violent behavior in language or uh, harassment of others or unwelcome sexual attention. Uh, any offensive comments that relate to someone's uh, uh, group, whether that's gender identity or race or ethnicity, physical appearance, economic status, immigra immigration status, etc. cetera. Uh, the policy prohibits deliberate misgendering or use of rejected names to describe groups of people. So it's important that we honor and respect uh, the identities and, and the names that people choose to be used to describe themselves. Um, and it also, the committee, I mean, the policy, I'm sorry, uh, prohibits advocating for encouraging any of the above behavior. So that's a, a, a relatively new document, I think was adopted uh, last year, um, where uh, the training that we'll be rolling out will be the initial training that uh, uh, for this code of conduct policy. Um, but the, the uh, and I, I want to, I want to make you aware that the origin of the of the uh, policy was with uh, people who are in uh, caucuses that represent many of the groups that traditionally have been disempowered or felt excluded, even in uh, 503s unions uh, union meetings and spaces. So uh, at this point, we're going to go into uh, breakout rooms. If you're familiar with Zoom. Uh, uh, People can be broken out into groups and have uh, individual discussions. So this is gonna be an opportunity uh, for us to uh, come together in some smaller groups and have some uh, interactive conversations. And uh, afterward, we'll, we'll come back out into the main room and I'll, I'll talk about some, uh, a bit about the governance of 503. Now in our, um, in our breakout rooms, we're going to uh, discuss um, what's up on your screen right now. For those of you that may be on the phone, uh, everyone uh, will have a chance to introduce themselves and say where they work and what position they were elected to. And crucially, where do you feel you need the, the most support? And uh, uh, someone will be taking notes, so we uh, will uh, gather this information. Uh, Mariko or Andrew, are you ready to go into the breakout groups? Okay, if you're uh, using a device, you should see something on your screen. You can go ahead and uh, join your breakout group. And if you don't, you'll be automatically sent to one. That includes people on the phone. So we'll see, see everybody together in a little bit. There are a quick video for us to uh, kick off our uh, overview of 503 governance. Go for it. SEIU 503 is a democratic member-run union of 72,000 people who work as care providers or in public service jobs around the state. This is how it all works. We are organized into sub-locals, each with its own leaders that are part of the statewide union. General Council is the supreme governing body of our union. It's where we vote on our bylaws to establish our policies and pass our budget for the next fiscal year. The 503 Board of Directors is where member leaders administer the affairs of the union. The Board of Directors includes our statewide leaders, Executive Director, President, VP Public Services, VP Care Provider, Secretary, Treasurer. Sublocal leaders administer sublocal affairs, control sublocal budgets, and are leaders in their work sites. The CAPE Council is a group of 53 elected members who recommend political endorsements to the Board of Directors. Our bylaws and our administrative policies and procedures are the governing documents of our union. Every other year, we elect more than 700 leaders into the governing bodies of our union. The people in these roles will shape our work as we bargain strong contracts, represent workers, and grow. Find out more at SEIU503.org forward slash we are 503. All right, thanks, Andrew. 
So a quick note, you may have uh, noted that in the uh, uh, slide about uh, sublocal responsibilities, one of them was controlling the sublocal's budget. Uh, we are going to be offering additional training that's uh, oriented toward sublocal presidents and treasurers um, to talk about the budget and the budget process at the sublocal level. Uh, any, any of you are welcome to participate in that if you wish, even though you're not uh, necessarily a president or treasurer of your sublocal. So here's a chart uh, that I drew up for uh, uh, for a presentation to uh, a sublocal just to outline 503's governance. Uh, if anyone uh, in the Zoom meeting is from the retiree uh, sublocal, I apologize, uh, but this was a, again, I lifted this from another presentation, but uh, it would look very similar for the retiree sublocal as well. So. As you picked up from the video, we are a democracy, and in particular, we are a representative democracy. We elect uh, people to office, such as yourselves, to carry out the governance of our union, and those governance positions, those offices, are filled by members uh, of the union. So the base is the active members uh, who vote, and also retiree members. Um, they vote for uh, uh, the, uh, the local positions, um, locals or sublocal positions, and when they vote for those positions, what's included in the vote is voting for members of their local to be general council delegates, which as the video stated is the supreme governing body of our union. What general council says goes, goes. That's uh, that directs and controls uh, what happens uh, within our union. Now, the regular sessions of general council are every other year. There's going to be one this year. It's an even numbered years. When they're in session, the, uh, what they do is they take up resolutions that have been that have been put forward by locals, uh, by the board of directors, or by uh, members, um, and uh, they uh, they will vote on those. Now, act, members also vote for the board of directors, which, as the video said, administers the affairs of our union, and they're the governing body in between sessions of general counsel. Uh, there's actually two lines of uh, voting, two types of representatives that everyone votes for. They vote for people uh, to represent their work sector. So everyone in a local will be in the, uh, in a, in the same work sector, and there may well be other uh, locals in that work sector as well. And then members also vote for uh, representatives from their geographic region. So all 503 members in that region across, uh, across sublocals will be voting for those regional directors. And those make up the uh, directors and assistant directors uh, on the board. Now active members also vote directly for statewide officers. And, uh, those were listed uh, in the uh, in the video. Statewide officers, uh, such as myself, uh, the 503 president, and Melissa, the executive director, and the other statewide officers are on the board of directors, and the board of directors are on general counsel. So active members actually vote for uh, multiple sets of general counsel delegates. They vote for uh, delegates from their locals. Uh, they vote for the board of directors who are on the who are general council delegates, and they vote for statewide officers who are general council delegates. And again, I want to repeat and reiterate: these positions, all these positions that you see here, are filled by members themselves. Um, Andrew, next slide. So. Um, we have, uh, we, we've talked about some of the documents that uh, uh, are set out to uh, establish our governance. And again, this is a slide I lifted from another presentation, but what this does is, is list, the, list the documents that can apply to our governance and list them in order of precedence. So anything, uh, anything on this list has to comply with everything that's above the list. If it's out of compliance, then uh, it won't be valid, but of course, uh, uh, the preeminent uh, uh, controlling documents are are the law. Um, 
the primary ones that come into play for our union are um, uh, the Labor Management uh, Reporting Disclosure Act, uh, that's LMRDA, you may have heard about that. That law applies to uh, 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 private uh, employees, non-public employees, because we, because we represent workers uh, who are private workers and not public employees. LMRDA provides at pro applies at least to them. And, in, and where we combine, at, where, where we're a combined union of public and private employees, then it applies to our union in general. The other major piece of legislation is uh, uh, called PECPA. This is a state law, the Public Employee Collective Bargaining Act. And that's the law that uh, allows um, and authorizes public employees in Oregon uh, to uh, organize as a union and collectively collective bargain. Now within our within our union, the preeminent uh, do governing document is 503 bylaws. I referred to those uh, earlier. Uh, the bylaws can only be changed by general counsel and only by a two thirds vote of general counsel. Uh, next would be general counsel resolutions. They don't necessarily they don't necessarily amend the bylaws, but they uh, set out uh, a policy or practice. Uh, those can be adopted by general counsel with a majority vote. Now we also have administrative policies and procedures, the AP and P. Uh, oh, and I should mention that um, you can find um, uh, the general counsel resolutions and the AP and P as well as the bylaws on our website. So those of you that are familiar with uh, the relationship between statutes and administrative rules, uh, that's roughly, or that's similar to the relationship between our bylaws and the AP and P. Uh, the AP and P sort of sets out uh, how we do things uh, as well as some policies. Uh, the general counsel can amend the AP and P with a majority vote, but the board of directors also uh, can amend uh, the AP and P unless it's something that the general counsel put in there. Now, next uh, in the order of priority for our governing documents is the sublocal constitution and bylaws, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Again, they have to comply with uh, the 503 general uh, documents. And last is the SAU constitution. Now, when I say SAU constitution here, what I'm referring to is SAU international. Um, not 503, 503 doesn't have a constitution. We simply uh, use the SAU constitution. However, um, we our history is that we started as our own independent union and then we chose to affiliate with SEIU, the international. That's how we became local 503. And we, uh, as a result of that process, we have an affiliation agreement. And under that agreement, uh, we can, um, we adopt uh, our own governance uh, provisions. So things in the SIU constitution that uh, talk about how locals are governed, such as uh, the length of terms and, uh, and things like that, don't apply to us if we already address them here uh, in our bylaws and other, other governing documents. But otherwise, uh, things in the SIU constitution do apply to us as well. So next slide, Andrew. And um, in your uh, documentation, there, uh, one, there should be a policy document which is called confidentiality policy. And I'm bringing this up because an important uh, piece of what you do and a question that we get is, how do you as the sublocal sub leaders communicate with your sublocal? Uh, how do you, if you wanna send them an email or if you wanna text them or if you want to call them, uh, how, how do you do that? And that uh, data uh, or access to that data to enable you to do that, uh, the policy and procedure for that is set out in the confidentiality policy. We have a confidentiality policy because our members, especially in the last number of years, given the events, have become uh, are sensitive about uh, their, their personal contact information. So we have a policy in place to uh, safeguard it. But of course, we do enable officers uh, to use it uh, as needed to carry out their duties. So take a look at that. Uh, uh, basically, uh, the sublocal president is authorized to uh, uh, obtain the information that they need to communicate uh, with the sublocal members. Uh, of course, there's other ways to 
communicate with members such as these Zoom meetings or uh, having 503 send out a email or a survey or something and you can work with your organizer on that. So talking about uh, contacting your organizer or where to go for assistance, um, I do want to make sure everyone is aware of the information here on this slide. Uh, in general, the very first place to go is to our Member Assistance Center or MAC. Uh, they're also connected to our Member uh, Resource Center, MRC, um, and uh, you can get them, uh, connect them with a, uh, connect with them with a simple phone call, 1-844-503-SEIU, uh, and the numbers for SEIU are 7348. So again, 1-844-503-SEIU. You also have your organizers, so there is an organizer assigned to your uh, sublocal, or at least perhaps your uh, uh, the region uh, 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 of your sublocal, um, and they're there to support you and to assist you. Now, if you're a public employee or work for a private nonprofit, uh, where you fit in the staff organization is you fit under our public services department. The director of that department is Molly Malone. Now, if you're a care provider, uh, our, uh, uh, we have a care provider department within the 503 structure. The director of that is Mallory Hagel. So these are also contact uh, points for you. And then uh, there's myself and Melissa. Uh, if you don't have our phone number or email address, um, uh, get it. Uh, you can request it. In fact, you can request it on chat if you, if you want if you need it, uh, but we're here for you, um, and uh, uh, we'll make ourselves available uh, to assist or answer questions or provide information. All right, Steve, you want to kick us off? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Welcome everyone. If you, uh, uh, most of you, if not all of you, I'm sure, uh, participated on Tuesday in the first part of our uh, local officer training. So welcome back. If you are, if you didn't uh, attend Tuesday, uh, welcome to the second part. You'll find that uh, going out of order uh, isn't going to be crucial or a big deal. Uh, a reminder, uh, if you're not using a device, you don't have access to chat, but you can raise your hand and also unraise your hand, uh, lower your hand by using star nine on your phone. If you're participating by phone, those of you with a device, you, you also have access to the raise hand and lower hand feature by uh, open, make sure that participant uh, tab is open. And you'll see the raise hand uh, down at the bottom of that tab. Uh, our agenda today is to hear, includes hearing from a panel of leaders uh, to talk about uh, some of the issues and uh, things uh, 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 member leaders deal with. Uh, then we're going to hear from uh, Melissa, our executive director, about uh, current and future challenges that we're all facing as uh, leaders of our union. And then uh, we're going to finish with uh, the breakout groups that Andrew mentioned and uh, to uh, have some small, smaller group uh, discussions about uh, being member leaders. So let's, uh, uh, again, I recognize we have an hour uh, and we want to uh, get, get through everything. I know this is a, a real popular uh, time for uh, people to have these meetings. I'm glad that I'm glad that works out, but we want to be efficient with our use of it. So let's go right into our, our leader panel. We have three people today who uh, are going to participate in our panel. Um, the word local has multiple uses <laughs> in 503, and one of those uses is to refer to local governments, and that's any government unit below the level of the state. It could be a county, it could be a city, it could be a, a water board or irrigation district or transit district. Uh, one of our really uh, strong uh, local government sublocals is the city of Beaverton. And one of our great leaders from that uh, sublocal is Adam Korst. Uh, he's one of our panelists today. 
another panelist is from a state agency that's a, uh, that has uh, had strong leadership in its local, and that's uh, the Oregon Department of Education. And uh, on the panel from that local is Paula Pena. And uh, the third member of our panel is Rhonda Morgan. Uh, Rhonda Morgan is a longtime, very experienced uh, member leader uh, from Department of Human Services, uh, one, of, uh, one of our large locals. And Rhonda also has uh, a additional perspective uh, as being a, con uh, she's currently a contract uh, specialist. And this is actually a new program. Rhonda's in the first wave but it's a result of an agreement uh, we reached in our um, uh, collective bargaining agreement for state employees, which provides for people to, uh, members to come off the job and, uh, and work uh, directly with members on behalf of uh, 503. And as you can tell from the title, contract specialist, a lot of it's uh, oriented around um, the, the collective bargaining agreement, including labor management committees. So the panel is going to discuss today uh, uh, why reaching out to new hires and uh, maintaining strong membership is important to us uh, for a strong sublocal. How they lead around worksite issues. Uh, we'll, they'll have an opportunity to, uh, to share tips and what their experience has been leading through challenges uh, that we're facing as a result of the Janus uh, ruling. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, that's the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that did away with uh, eliminated fair share uh, payers in uh, public uh, employee unions. Uh, an earlier ruling did away with fair share payments for uh, home care workers. And, and uh, also challenges we're, we're uh, facing ongoing from the Freedom Foundation, who's, who's constantly trying to think of ways to uh, weaken uh, and destabilize our union. So let's jump into that. And I'm going to invite uh, Paula uh, to uh, respond to any one or uh, two of those uh, that you'd like to address and share with us. Paula, are you there? Hi, Steve. I am. How's everybody doing? Um, again, my name is Paula Pena. I'm with the Oregon Department of Education, which is sublocal 581. Um, I'm the elected treasurer for my sublocal. Um, also, for those who don't know, sorry, that's my son. He's watching Dynasty, <laughs> the, the original show. <laughs> um, for those who don't know, I'm also um, part of the Women of Color Caucus. Um, I'm one of the co-chairs. I'm also involved with the Indigenous Caucus, and I am um, the chief person for um, my sublocal for the CAP team, the Call, of, um, call to Action team. And so um, the way I'd lead through um, is usually through compassion and, um, and, and the passion that I have um, for in the injustice things that happen, whether that be um, wrongfully terminated, being singled out for whatever reason. Um, I tend to gather a lot of information from my sublocal members, and then uh, I do a lot of networking. I'm really good at networking. So um, for me, as I was thinking about, one of the reasons why it's so important to reach out for new hires is um, we often want to belong in our new workplace, AKA our new home, because we spend more time at work than our, you know, in the office for the most part. Um, we, we want to be involved and union involvement gives, I, I had to write everything down. <laughs> union involvement gives us this in a form of a walk in a, in a welcoming feeling. Um, it allows us to tap into a support system of, of more experienced colleagues. Um, so that's why it's really important. And, um, and who doesn't want to be part of something? I mean, uh, we are creatures, but like to socialize and whether we're socializing through zoom or wherever it's really important to reach out to those new hires and let them know hey they're not alone we've all been there and um so what was the other question <laughs> <laughs> whatever you want to share with us paula 
okay, so, um, and I, one of the things I wanted to share with y'all is some of the things I share in some of our NEOs is um, when I do one-on-ones, when I have more time to talk to them, I talk with my hands, sorry, you'll see them. Um, for me, unions are important because, um, especially through SEIU, they help support and set, set standards for education, skill level, wages, working conditions, and um, a quality of life. And um, I'll touch, you know, Nanette, um, D. Carter helped, um, and I'll share this. A D. Carter helped, and I share this in, in our NEOs and with our new members, uh, helped my husband begin the citizenship classes. He became a U.S. citizen in January. I see how you pitched through that. Um, he was a 30 year permanent resident. So, um, SEIU has been being having a union job has helped me um, be the main provider for my fam my small family of seven for health care. Uh, yeah, I have a small family counting myself for a family of seven, five boys. If you count my husband, six boys. Um, but if you ask my husband, he'll say it's five boys and a girl. <laughs> Um, so that's what it, it's helped us. Um, my house is almost paid off. We, uh, we bought our house 20 years ago. Come June 25th, I will have been living in our house. Um, come June 25th, I'll be working with the state 15 years. So my house is almost paid for. Paula? Hey, Paula. Thank yeah. you. We need to move on, though. Okay. We're in a time crunch here. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that, though. Mm -hmm. Hey, Adam. Uh, City of Beaverton uh, sublocal has traditionally had a very strong membership. Uh, any tips you want to sh uh, share with us about why that is, or uh, anything else from your experience there from this from that sublocal? Absolutely. Can you guys hear me? Okay. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, again, my name is Adam Course. I'm the the newly elected president of uh, City of Beaverton sublocal 198. Um, you know, I, we, we've had a lot of success in our, our sub-local for, I, I think, a variety of reasons. Um, I, I think just really trying to be inclusive of everyone. Um, I, I think we've done a very good job at recognizing that, you know, our, our employees and our, our members are a very diverse crowd um, with a lot of different opinions, uh, different thoughts, different beliefs, and, and different desires for how the union should function, um, and just the workplace in general should function. Um, and we've we've really put an emphasis on hey we want to hear all those voices that you know we can't uh, necessarily reflect all of those voices in the decisions we make, um, but every single voice of every single opinion is is really important to us and, and just really makes us stronger and more informed in the decisions we make. Um, so I think that we've really reached out really hard to all of our members that, that I can and, and that our leadership team can, um, just to make sure that, you know, they might be part of the minority, but they're being heard as well. Um, I, I think that's one of the things that's really made us very strong. Um, and I, I think city management recognizes that too, um, which really just kind of strengthens our voice when it comes to negotiating and bargaining. I, I think one of the other things that we've done that's really made us successful in, in um, and, and that I'm really proud of, is we've really worked to develop a good relationship with our management. Um, and I, I think that that's not always the case or not always the reputation of cases with a lot of unions, um, but I found it really benefits us. Um, you know, we, we pick our fights carefully. Um, we, we really, uh, you know, we don't want to pick every single little fight. We pick the ones that, you know, are, are important to our members that make a big difference. Um, and it really allows us to kind of work with management so they know what's important to us too. Um, I, I think those are the biggest things we've, we've done to be successful in Beaverton. Um, and in doing so, we maintain like a 92 to 93% membership despite uh, Janice and things like that. Uh, so we continue to reach out to everybody. Um, we put a lot of time into our NEOs to make sure that new employee orientations, to make sure that everybody feels welcomed, informed. Um, and we, we really draw up a lot of um, information on kind of what the last contract would have looked like. Um, should we not have been able to negotiate it, like what the city just kind of offered us in the first place, um, compared to where we landed. And so we're really able to provide hard numbers to our employees, um, really able to show them that regardless of their views, we want them to be part of, you know, part of our group. Um, and um, that, you know, regardless of their, excuse me, regardless of the views, I already said that one, um, and that we are going to work hard with their managers um, to really kind of make sure we have that good relationship so, so that should there be a problem, there's a very open line of communication. Adam, yep. 
Rhonda, Adam works in, uh, Adam's with the sublocal where all the members work in one city. You're in a sublocal where members are scattered all over Oregon in every city and in a lot of towns. Uh, what works at DHS? You there, Rhonda? We're not hearing you. I am, sorry, I had the chat oh. box over the unmute part. Technology. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Technology is fun. So yeah, so I'm part of Local 200, which represents all the workers in both the Department of Human Services and the Oregon Health Authority. So you're right. It's a very diverse body of work that, that our members do, and they are all over the state. So some very conservative areas, some um, areas that are very progressive, and how do you keep everyone together, and how do you, how do you build toward best outcomes for everyone when everyone is so different? Um, the challenge is real. And I would say that it comes down to something that both Adam and Paula mentioned. It's about being inclusive. It's about fostering environments and building belonging in our union where all members, regardless of, of what they look like or who they love or what their political ideology is, they all see themselves as part of our union, as belonging to the greater whole. I think that um, to do that, you know, you have to you have to make sure that you focus your energy on what it is that you want to build, because as new leaders, and let me just say thank you for stepping up. Um, this is not an easy gig. Sometimes it feels very thankless. Sometimes you're going to put in a lot of hours, and you're going to throw your hands up and say, "Why am I doing this?" And then you're going to tap back into that part of you that made you want to step up to begin with, that made you want to, want to make a difference for those around you. And focus on what it is that you, want to, that you want to build. Otherwise, you're going to be putting out fires and putting out fires and putting out fires and your term's going to be over and you're going to say, what the hell do I do for two years, right? So focus on what it is that you want to build because when your base is strong, you can weather those challenges, whether they're political or they're... Um, you know, budgetary, because we're a lot of public service, right? Um, or whether it's dynamics, we'll call it that, that happen within the work site that can be polarizing. If your base is strong and everyone feels like they belong, you can weather those challenges. And the last thing I'm gonna say is, as leaders, I would encourage you to, to be diligent in seeking all the information you need, beware of um, confirmation bias, right? So get all the information you need to make those decisions. Be thoughtful, think it all through. And then once you make that decision, sleep well at night because there's a lot of stuff that's gonna be happening in our union and in our, our society at large. And we need you guys to, to be able to be all in and we need you to take care of yourselves while you're doing it. That's what I got. Thank you very much, Rhonda. Uh, Adam and Paula, thank you both as well. And I'm, uh, I'm glad. Uh, just as I, just as you're all glad, and I'm glad that we have new people stepping up into these positions. Sometimes for the first time, I'm I'm very glad for all of you that uh, uh, have kept at it and, and come back after doing terms and multiple terms. And uh, you're inval you're invaluable. I appreciate it very much. So uh, we're going to move on now to challenges. Melissa, go. Well, first off, I just want to um, encourage folks. I mean, um, there's uh, lots of new leaders on this, and there's also um, we're current like leaders who have been a part of our union and leading our union in many different ways for years. And um, I notice people are chatting. If folks have ideas to add to what um, Paula and Adam and Rhonda said, please chat them. Um, <clears throat> please share them. I think it's really helpful to get tips or ideas or things that you're just proud of that you do in your local um, that people should feel free to share. And um, I think it's a really helpful, I think it's a helpful way for folks to learn. Um, so I did want to talk a little bit about just like, what are some of the challenges? And some of them are clear. Um, if we could raise hands easily and we were in a room right now, I'd ask how many people um, had um, been in communication with other members or other represented folks about um, 
about um, the Freedom Foundation or had gotten an email or had unsubscribed to a Freedom Foundation list and they're clear, um, they're a clear challenge because they um, tell lies about our union. They also um, clearly are trying to um, make sure that people aren't members and that is all in an effort to weaken um, unions. And it's not done by, you know, a handful of folks who have spent time on their own coming up with this plan. It's really done by, um, you know, well-funded um, think tanks and well-funded um, really um, national fringe organizations that have decided, um, sorry, I couldn't, I kept hearing the TV in my background. My kids are downstairs. Um, but um, I really decided that like unions were a strength um, and that they needed to do whatever they could and um, really um, try to dismantle them. And they had a special focus on public sector unions. And the reason is because they really saw that um, while private sector unions have been dismantled through federal laws and through a weak and um, national labor relations board, um, public sector unions have continued to grow and thrive. And in public sector, I include our union um, because we're a publicly funded local, which includes public service workers, um, state workers, local government workers, but also care providers who are publicly funded. And so they've really taken a unique attack on us. And that came through both Harris, which was a decision that impacted home care workers and caregivers, saying um, that people who got representation and services did not have to pay into that representation and services. And then um, that it continued with the Janus decision. And now it continues with them doing um, work on the ground with the Freedom Foundation. People should definitely, if you have ideas or things that you all have done in your work site or in your community, um, to make sure you're having communication and honest communication about the Freedom Foundation Foundation, add that into the chat. It's so important that people are learning from it. Um, I know, you know, but just going back to Adam's story about how they have really high membership at the city of Beaverton, they've also done some really great strong work in terms of communicating about the Freedom Foundation from a strong message of the leadership. I'm just being very clear about who they are and what their interest is, because their interest is to keep membership low. Um, and um, to dismantle the power that you all have built over the years um, by coming together and in, um, in union. And so that's one, that's one struggle we continue to face. It's not the only one though. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is on the horizon that we as a union are super concerned about is um, we hear from our members time and time again, like the most consistent message is that um, people care um, about their benefits and about their healthcare benefits. And I think Paula said this, right? That she provides healthcare to her family of seven through her job and that is a critical element to why it's so important. And so, you know, one of the things that we continue to see nationally is attacks on people's ability to afford health care. And we know that the less people who have health care and the less people who have access to health care and quality health care, um, the um, harder it is for our workers and our um, to maintain the health care that they have. Um, and so that includes public workers and home care workers who have fought hard to create health care that is um, quality and that is affordable. We also have that fight continuing for many of our workers. Nursing home workers continue to face struggles in making sure that they can afford health quality health care. And so the fights that um, are exist around the ACA right now actually are very, they're very dangerous um, for our ability to maintain um, quality health care. And we know, like, we know that that's our members top priority um, in almost every bargaining survey. And then I think we know that right now in this COVID crisis that it's impacting working Oregonians in a, uh, in a way that we can't even imagine. Um, you know, our higher ed workers who are on the phone have seen drastic cutbacks on campuses. Luckily, the employers have um, worked with us to create policies where people are keeping their benefits, but um, people um, are on a, unemployment um, across the board. You know, I think I said this stat, but I think it's just a really important stat. 400,000 people in Oregon are unemployed. 75% of the people who are unemployed in Oregon make under $55,000 a year. Um, so the people who have been most impacted by this pandemic um, are working Oregonians um, who um, uh, really um, live paycheck to paycheck um, and are at risk. And so I think, I think that we really need to continue to look at these threats. And I think one of the questions that we really wanna focus on and how we wanna look at this work is just like what is it knowing these threats whether they're the freedom foundation which is a well-funded right-wing organization covid and you know i really i talk about covid a lot and one of the ways that i think about it is that it is really just highlighting inequities that existed in our economy before 
So um, that means that nursing homes um, are dangerous places sometimes, but that existed before in a flu pa pandemic. It means that um, black and brown people are dying at a higher rate, and that's because there was inequities in our society before this pandemic. And the list goes on and on about the inequities in our society that are highlighted through COVID. And so what, as a, you know, as a union, with all these attacks that are coming at us, and as the leaders, you know, all of you on this call are the leaders of our union. What is what is the opportunity to lead through that? What are ways? I'm I'm really glad people are sharing on the chat. Please continue to do that. And um, what are the ways that leaders um, that we as a union need to show up in this moment? And what is a way as leaders um, that everyone needs to show up in this moment? So um, I'm going to turn it over. We're going to do some breakouts and have um, some conversations that hopefully get at some of these topics. Um, but I think that's really what we're um, want to spend some time doing. And um, I think I heard, I saw someone's chat that they really enjoyed the sub-local regional meetings. Those were um, really important. We, we were actually hoping to do them during this local leader. We were gonna invite people to come and have more regional meetings during the local leader training. That didn't work out this time. But I think one of the things that were so valuable about, valuable about them was not only um, our ability to share information with leaders, but to hear from leaders. Um, about what we as a union can do, how leaders need support, what leaders are thinking about, and that's what we want to do in some of these small group discussions, is really think about that with you all. Um, and we are going to continue regional meetings. We're also going to continue um, monthly, we're going to start monthly phone calls with local leaders um, to try to do some of that um, feedback loop, which we think is really important. So um, I'm turning it over 